Coming up on DTNS, who might have conducted the social engineering attack on Twitter? Knock, knock, who's there? Not security. And happy World Emoji Day. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 17th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From hot and humid Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. Sitting in the background, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chan. Ah, we were just talking about how Henry Cavill, not so mainstream, folks. Uh, you want to find out that discussion, go ahead over to Good Day Internet. Get it by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Reuters reports that some K-pop stars' accounts have been blocked on Douyin, which is TikTok's app in China. South Korea's communications regulator fined TikTok 186 million won, that's about 154,000 U.S. dollars, on Wednesday for collecting personal information of children under 14 without consent from guardians and not disclosing or notifying users of their personal information was sent overseas. Some people drew a correlation between these two events. A TikTok spokesperson said that the accounts in question, we're working normally on TikTok, and the Dalian operates independently. Microsoft announced it ended production of the Xbox One X and the Xbox One S All Digital Edition consoles as it ramps up production on the upcoming Xbox Series X. The company said the standard Xbox One S will continue to be manufactured and sold globally. Apple updated its style guide in an effort to remove non-inclusive language across Xcode, platform APIs, documentation, and its open source projects. The company said developer APIs with exclusionary terms will be deprecated as Apple introduces replacements. Apple did provide an exemption for use of the words blacklist and whitelist if either are used in code that's being documented that can't be changed. Uh, in that instance, developers just show code samples to illustrate what users need to enter, and then in the description can use alternatives like allow list, deny list, etc. On July 16th, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency issued an emergency order giving federal agencies 24 hours to patch Windows servers used for a domain name system purposes or apply another mitigation. Others have until July 24th. Microsoft issued a patch for a workable Windows domain name system server, server vulnerability on Tuesday. Apple trade tension in China story alert. Luxshare Precision Industry is acquiring Taiwan-based Winstrom Corp's iPhone production business in China in a $472 million deal. Wistron is a contract manufacturer for Apple's iPhones and said of the deal, it has agreed to sell two subsidiaries in eastern China for 3.3 billion yuan to Luxshare. And uh, going along with that, Apple assembly partner Pegatron is readying its first plant in India. Back in June, the Indian government announced a $6.6 .6 billion plan to bring more smartphone manufacturers into the country. Foxconn and Wistron already have plants to manufacture iPhone handsets in southern India. So that's happening more and more. IBM's X-Force Iris security team obtained 40 gigabytes of data as it was being uploaded to a server hosting domains known to be used by Iranian group IRG18. The data included training videos showing how to compromise accounts and manage compromised accounts in Zimbra. Zimbra. Ah, Zimbra. Forgot about you. The data also included online personas and phone numbers used by group members. All right, let's get you updated on what's going on with the uh, Twitter social engineering attack. Uh, Twitter announced, quote, we believe approximately 130 accounts were targeted by the attackers in some way as part of the incident. So it, it sounds like they've figured out which accounts were accessed in their admin tool. Uh, Twitter goes on to say, for a small subset of these accounts, the attackers were able to gain control of the accounts and then send tweets from those accounts. Uh, we gave you an example yesterday of at six, uh, not letting someone tweet because they gained control back. So that could explain why there's a subset here. Uh, Twitter has not determined if direct messages were accessed. They're still working on that. Brian Krebs uh, has an in-depth look at what we know about the attack itself over at Krebs on Security. SIM swappers, which are a community that try to gain access to phones by getting the accounts swapped to, to new SIM cards, it's a social engineering attack to call the phone company and convince them to swap service to a different SIM card. Uh, that community exists, and in that community, there are folks who prize getting control with that method of what they call an OG account. Uh, that's usually indicated by short profile names because those are 
accounts that were there from the beginning. Days before the Bitcoin posts appeared on Twitter Wednesday, a post in the OG users section of an account hijacking forum was offering access to either change the email address tied to any Twitter account for 250 bucks or to give direct access to a Twitter account for between two and $3,000. This jives with what we mentioned yesterday about the account at six getting a password reset confirmation code hours before the Bitcoin post began to appear. Krebs adds that Lucky225, who controls at six, had disabled SMS for 2FA. He got the password reset confirmation to the phone number because the attackers had changed the email address and disabled 2FA. So that alerted him something was wrong and he was able to get his account access back quickly. Krebs also does some sleuthing, noting the similarity in a profile pic and a pool shown in a profile background shot to a known SIM swapper who goes by Plugwalk Joe, who is thought to be involved in the SIM swap that gained access to Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey's account last year. Now, if you're wondering why President Trump's account was not affected on Wednesday, the New York Times is reporting that after past incidents, presumably the one that uh, involved an accidental suspension of the account for 11 hours on November 2nd, 2017, the president's account was given extra protections. In fact, the Wall Street Journal reported back in 2017 that Twitter said it had limited the number of employees who could manage the president's account. So even if they had access to this admin tool, that may not have given them the additional access to the president's account. So that may be why the president's account was unaffected. Reuters reports that Twitter has been without a chief information security officer, or CISO, since December. Uh, something they probably wish they had uh, it right shows. now, right? Uh -huh. right. Yeah, it some shows. applicants are like, uh, <laughs> could have done this from home. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a tough one. Rob, what do you make of this story? I know you weren't with us when we kind of went through it yesterday, but it, the details keep coming out. Yeah, I know you guys covered this uh, you know, in detail yesterday, and, and I said a, a little earlier that uh, these are the most underachieving hackers I've seen in a long time. The level of access that they had. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not rooting for them to have done more than they, than they, than they right. did. That's right. not what I'm saying. But I mean, when, you, when you're talking about the, the accounts they had, you know, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Bill Gates, uh, Kanye, when they, <laughs> the accounts that they had, they really could have wreaked havoc and done a, a lot of harm um, and, and a lot of damage. Um, so to only get away with what they got away with, um, you know, is, uh, like I said, kind of underwhelming. But uh, as far as the security aspect of this is that, um, you know, Twitter is going to have to make some significant changes in um, this. It, it can't be a person or two was socially engineered, which is the, you know, I think that's the, the story that's going now that, you know, you know, somebody, pro you know, potentially got socially engineered and that's how they got access to this system. It can't just be a couple of people that that happens to, and you are hacking former presidents, but you know, um, you know, people running for president, Bill Gates, Apple, you, you know, it should not be, um, that easy to uh, you know to get a hold of these accounts. So I, I think you're going to see uh, a lot more postmortem going on, and there's going to be a lot. You know, some some jobs are going to change. Some you know some teams are going to be added. Things things are going to be switched around. This this is a major major security uh, breach uh, for Twitter. And it it does uh, strike me as you know 63 percent chance. Uh, this was folks trying to make a, a rep for themselves. Uh, that is very common, as we talked about in the OG user scene. Uh, and being able to go in and make some cash selling these until they got noticed by some of the accounts like At6 and then realized, well, this is going to get noticed soon. Let's go out in a blaze of glory. Let's let's post to every account, the highest profiles account we can get access to, try to collect some Bitcoin on the way out the door. That does strike me as the most likely uh, explanation here. If that is the case, they still might have grabbed some DM information and downloaded it, and we will see that peddled uh, at some point if that's true. Well, we mentioned yesterday that Netflix named Ted Sarandos co-CEO, along with current CEO Reed Hastings, and that the company gained 10.1 million subscribers worldwide in its last quarter, which is almost as much as all of 2019, pushing its total number to 193 million. Those sound like good numbers, right? 
Well, there is some bad news because earnings per share for the quarter were $1.59, which is quite a bit lower than the $1.81 expected. Also, Netflix says it expects to add 2.5 expect said expected to add 2.5 million subscribers in Q3. And the street says, well, we expected 5.27 million subscribers. So that's also way lower uh, by about half. In its earning letter, uh, Netflix wrote, quote, growth is slowing as consumers get through its initial shock of COVID and social restrictions. Our paid net additions for the month of June also included the subscriptions that we canceled for the small percentage of members who had not used the service recently. Yeah, so I that story that's comes up. back up again. Yeah. It's... Yeah, I don't think that's going to make a huge number, but I think what Netflix is is pointing out here is there's still an economic hit that's going to tighten some belts, and we're ready for that. People are going to cancel accounts because of that, and uh, places are opening up. Uh, more more places around the world are opening up. Not the United States at the moment, but uh, but other places are, and that means people are going to be going back outside. They're not going to need Netflix as much, and so they expect to see uh, more people cancel. Plus, they got ahead of themselves. A bunch of people who may have subscribed later finally got around to it, uh, got around to it faster. Uh, and so, you know, this this 10 million uh, that they added this last quarter is is a few people that that would have added later. Uh, and and so they're they're banking folks ahead of time. I think those three things are why Netflix is saying don't expect a great quarter next quarter because this this isn't going to last forever. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people um, who have a lot of stuff that's not Netflix to watch, you know, TV online as well. I mean, you know, Netflix was the big dog and they, they are the big dog, but there is a tremendous amount of competition out there for them as well. So people just have other options. Um, Peacock just launched a couple days ago. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to really compete with Netflix, at least not, you know, not yet. But it's something else that people, yeah, this is free. Let me go check this out. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not terribly shocked, uh, you know, by the numbers. I think a, a big part of this is that they, they really crush Q1 um, and that kind of really skew things. Um, and it's, you know, it's just, you know, Q1 was was great, but now we're in a pandemic. Things are going to look different. Yeah. Q1 and Q2 both uh, were great. And they're, what they're saying is Q3, don't, they're getting ahead of it, which is good to them. Like, don't get too excited about Q3, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's you know a combination of like you said, Tom. You know, people, you know, their daily habits have changed quite a bit uh, from what everyone was doing six months ago. That definitely factors into it. And Rob, to your point, there are just there's just more competition. It, yeah. You pay for Netflix, and you have a couple other services that maybe have like that, that one or maybe even two shows, or movies, or you know, library, whatever it is that you like. You're not going to pay for all of it. And, you know, with more uh, options, that's great for consumers, but it's not necessarily great for Netflix. The Intercept reported an internal bulletin from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security drafted in conjunction with other U.S. federal agencies that discusses the potential impacts that widespread use of protective masks could have on security operations that incorporate facial recognition systems to monitor public spaces during the ongoing COVID-19 public health emergency and in the months after the pandemic subsides. Uh, facial recognition systems affected include video cameras, image processing ho- hardware and software, and image recognition algorithms. And it basically, uh, you know, the, the home, Homeland Security is basically worried that protesters might wear cloth masks to evade detection while acknowledging, but it really has no specific information, that uh, violent extremists or other criminals in the United States are using protective face coverings to conduct attacks. Uh, several cities, including Boston, Oakland, and San Francisco, have stopped the use of facial recognition by law enforcement, and a law to prohibit its use by federal agencies was introduced in the U.S. House last month. Um, me, personally, I'm not concerned that Homeland can, you know, Homeland is concerned about this. I mean, I understand that they are, but I'm not concerned because one of the reasons that these big cities are banning it in their cities and we're looking to potentially get this banned across the country is because facial recognition is not a hundred percent. And specifically speaking of uh, people of color, it's not very good at all. Um, you know, and even more so women of color, it is quite horrible. So, um, you know, the, these companies need to do better. Um, and, you know, I've been a proponent of look at the irises of people. Um, when you look at the, the eyes don't change on people, uh, and, and, unless you're putting context in which these systems should be able to detect that. 
So, um, you know, I think that they need to get a lot better before we start using them for law enforcement, because there's just so many false positives, um, particularly uh, for uh, minorities, um, you know, in, in this country. So I'm not concerned that they're concerned. I just hope that, you know, that organizations just get better at what they do and start looking to people's eyes. That's really interesting about the eyes, right? Because what this story, when I first read this story, I thought, well, then they should back off on facial recognition because, you know, people need to wear masks right now. Uh, that is the health guidance. And, and they may or may not, but a lot of people are. So it's another reason why facial recognition just is, is even less effective. And of course, we had the recent stories, as you alluded to, of, of two black men in Detroit getting falsely arrested. Turns out they weren't the person, but facial recognition had indicated maybe they were. Uh, so I, my first reaction was, well, this is another reason to back up facial recognition. But I like your take of this is a reason to focus on recognizing the eyes, recognizing the part that is visible, uh, and, and work on, on making that work better uh, and be equitable, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, I'm curious if we'll see companies start to pitch solutions for that. Uh, I, they might not because this is just such a hot button issue and we've seen IBM and others just back away entirely saying, you know what, we're just not going to market this uh, for law enforcement uses yet. But I, I'm going to keep my eye out. Ha, no, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> and, and we're not the only countries working on this. I mean, mm -hmm. they're using this in Asia as well. And Max are a thing. In Asia, I mean, it's, yep. you know, it's it's been this way for years. So they are focusing on eyes there, just because so many people, just as a it's a matter of fashion at this point, wear a mask all the time. Um, so facial recognition simply just would not work um, in extremely large countries that are far east of here. So um, it, it's, this is, uh, you know, like I said, it's it, it is a concern, but eh, I'm not that concerned because you need to get a lot of things right uh, before you start using this stuff anyway. Well, if you're not familiar with knock codes, it's a method to provide hard to crack passwords that are easy to remember. Usually used as phone pins, providing a two by two grid that you knock in a pattern. They're harder for somebody to see over your shoulder since they can be entered on a black screen. And they should be harder to guess since people don't or shouldn't anyway, use patterns like birthdays or other easy to guess numbers. LG markets it as an advantage for its phones, and around 2.5 million in, uh, people in the U.S. use knock codes on their phone. So, folks at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, the George Washington University, and Ruhr University, Botcham, studied how much better knock codes are than other passwords. And it turns out, not really all that much better. 18% of all knock codes in use are for four different password sequences. The 30 most popular codes make up 42% oh, because people tend to start in the upper left and take similar routes. It's just human nature. Oddly, making the grid two by two made passwords easier to guess. Two by three, rather. Also, 20% of participants in the study couldn't remember their pattern 10 minutes later. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, this is a classic example of humans are often the weakest part of any security scheme because on paper, knock codes should be better than a birthday, right? A birthday can be discovered and found out, but a knock code, what do you, how are you going to know what knock code the person created, right? It's, it's going to be easy to remember. Well, first of all, it's not easy to remember if 20% of the participants can't remember it 10 minutes later. Right. Uh, and, and also, uh, if everybody's doing the same patterns, you know, 40, what was it? 42%, uh, worth 30 codes. That's pretty easy to brute force. Yeah, it's extremely it's... easy to brute force. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 42 percent, you're going to get a lot of them right on the first try or two. So, um, yeah, this is use use a passcode, use a password. Um, you know, I understand that they want to make these things more secure, but this is one of those things to where. I just say, hey, you're probably doing too much with not code. <laughs> it's, 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 let's it's, go to it's something a, a little bit. The idea uh, that should have worked, right? Like on, it's on paper, it should be more secure and it's easier for people, right? Than having to remember, except it's not like we thought it would be, but it's not because well, human psychology I mean, just doesn't work. Especially way. because, you know, 40% of us are like, this is probably a really good code. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> happens to be the same one that everybody else I'm picks. I'm just going to go up in the top right and then down and then back and then down. Yeah, this, so, yeah, this so feels very secure. Same, yeah, so many people are using the same ones. It's like, did you like, to, look, dude, this code, nobody's ever going to figure it out. Watch. 
can you show your code to someone else? Because that is a staggering number that uh, more yeah. than four out of 10 are using one of 30 different things that you can put in here. That's uh, that's that's not secure at all. This, this is another argument for having a password manager pick your password because you are a human. You think as like other humans, even though you may think you're unique. Uh, and and if you have a password manager pick a random password, it's going to pick a stronger password than you will pick if you pick it yourself. Absolutely. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, uh, please go subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. It is World Emoji Day, and we thought, you know what? It's been a hard week of news. It's just been a hard week in general. Uh, it's 2020, so let's uh, celebrate emojis. Google and Apple revealed their versions of the 117 new emoji coming later this year as part of the emoji update to Unicode 13.0. Uh, you'll find bison, beaver, polar bear, tamales, boba tea, a teapot, a slightly smiling face. If you never thought the faces smiled the exact amount you wanted, this might help. Uh, two people hugging, a man in a veil, a woman in a tuxedo, a person feeding a baby. Sarah, what's your favorite of the 117 <laughs> new emoji? Oh, man, emoji. I am not the biggest emoji user, but I did have to laugh when we were having our pre-show meeting earlier. I was like, well, I'm super glad that we have a lung emoji now. And everyone was like, what? What do you mean? And I was like, you know, the lung emoji. Like a picture of lungs inside a human like, body. I kept, I kept was like, like oh. lung emoji. Yeah. Right, right. No, it's it, partially because, because it's I, so... I hadn't realized there was a lung emoji coming. I'm I'm very glad now. That there is. Well, and it's like it's so easy to be like, that's so silly. Like, what's the point? But like, this is a way that people legitimately communicate. Uh, even though I, you know, I I am less of an emoji user in a sequence maybe than the next person. The lung emoji is not just about, you know, my lung health, but like, I don't know, I went on a run or it's a way to express yourself in a creative way that I think, you know, is is cool. And the more we have, I know people are actually enthusiastic about this and it it's not whimsical. It's it's real communication. Well, in many ways, it actually kind of reminds me of like a modern day hieroglyphics, but because of it's all yeah. symbol based you can actually communicate with someone who you might not be able to speak to them in their native language and they may not be able mm -hmm. to speak in yours. But if you give a thumbs up, generally that's a universal sign of, hey, things are good or you did a good job or some sort of positive interaction. Um, you know, in the same way that when you go to the airport, a lot of the symbology is very similar for the restroom, for the taxi mm -hmm. yep. or whatever. Universal so symbols, even if, right? So if you don't speak English and you're in an, uh, an, an English-speaking airport, you know where to go if you need to use the restroom or to catch a taxi. Um, you, you just made a point that actually is a really good one. I have uh, quite a few friends that are Russian, so oftentimes I will see in their Facebook feed where they're talking in Russian. And I, I just I can't follow that. I don't speak it. I don't read it. I don't write it. But there will be times when there will be a bunch of Russian, but then there will also be a bunch of emojis. And I can kind of figure out from the emo oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. And I'll reply back and then, oh, my bad, Rob. Uh, let me write it in English so you'll know the whole story. But the, the, that has actually happened to me relatively recently. So it, that, that's a good point that emojis do allow you to communicate across language barriers. Did y'all know that emoji date back to 1862? Uh, I did what? not. The, uh, the next web notes, the first emoticon, a smiley, was printed on August 6th, 1862 in a transcribed copy of a speech by President Lincoln. Everyone's pretty certain it was a typo, <laughs> but it is there. Uh, the first intentional known use uh, still dates back to the 19th century, March 30th, 1881, when the satirical magazine Puck published a piece on typographical art. Uh, emoticons were devised for joy, melancholy, indifference, and astonishment. They weren't called emoticons, but you can look at them. They're, you know, colons and parentheses and all of the, the kinds of mm -hmm. things you would look at and understand. The modern emoticon arose September 19th, 1982 in a posting made at 11.44 a.m. by Professor Scott Fallman, who proposed using the character colon dash end paren to indicate jokes on a computer science department bulletin board at Carnegie Mellon University. He also, in the same post, suggested the colon dash open parenthesis for frowny. 
Uh, so that that's really when the modern emoji was born. The emoticon, of course, the, the predecessor of the emoji. Um, Unicode first added characters from Zap Dingbats in uh, June 1993, which were kind of emoji-like. Uh, yeah. AOL Instant Messenger added buddy icons on May 1st, 1997, also kind of emoji-like. But the actual emoji... Uh, Japanese artist Shigeta Kurita created a set of 176 of them to convey information on the mobile platform he worked on. On February 22nd, 1999, customers of NTT Docomo, uh, the mobile operator of the NTT Group and partner company NTT Data, started being able to send those digital icons as part of text messages through mobile communications. Gmail brought them along October 23rd, 2008. IOS uh, added them for SoftBank users in Japan, November 21st, 2008. That's when I got them because there were a lot of workarounds to make them show up in iOS, even if you weren't a SoftBank user. And then October 12th, 2010, emoji were officially accepted into the Unicode standard 6.0. Uh, and then uh, to, to your point, Roger, February 19th, 2013, Moby Dick was translated into emoji. Was it, uh, was it a very long read? It's still a long read. Not quite just as different. Long. Yeah. Just different. <laughs> quite a bit different. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I I still use like ASCII uh, you know, emojis, mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. old school stuff, you know, for fun, and that's part of the vernacular in its own way, but you know, the the idea that this all started a lot longer ago than many people realize you know it's not just about like cute hearts and um you know winky faces and stuff like that it it was really a way to convey an emotion that would otherwise require a sentence maybe two kind of thing and that is that's where i think that you know sometimes you can get caught up in like the cutesiness aspect of this and it really is a way to communicate you can put a variety of emoji in order and convey lots of things, sentences, emotions, uh, what you're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> you know, the whole thing. How do you say it, world emoji day in emoji? Globe. Uh, I don't know what the emoji for emoji is. Emoji is. I know. That's where I got hung up. Too. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, it would Maybe be a calendar. A it would be a calendar entry for day. Yeah. That's a very good question. Rob, I don't know. What do you got? I was just going to say the, <laughs> the, the the world, a bunch of random emojis, then the calendar <laughs> emoji for day. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Right. Work. Yeah. Well, everybody, if you like stories about emoji and any other story that we talk about on the show and off the show, you can join in our uh, conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNF. You can uh, type in just emojis there if you want. You All could, right, let's check yes. out the mailbag. <laughs> we'll just decipher it. Uh, Phil wrote in and said, following up on new ways to check out of stores and the handheld scanners in UK supermarkets over the last 10 years, that was one of our mailbag uh, uh, entries from a couple of days ago, Phil says, more recently is something I've only seen so far in Decathlon, which is a French sports store with outlets all over Europe. The first time I went to a new outlet near me in Stockholm, Sweden, I spent 30 seconds looking for the barcode reader to scan my items at the self-checkout before realizing that everything in my basket had already appeared on the checkout screen. Rather than barcodes, they have RFID chips in every label or every item. So when you place anything in your basket next to the till, it scans everything and immediately comes up with a list and cost of everything in the basket, whether items are obscured or on top of each other, inside each other, it works well. I was very impressed with the speed and ease of use, and you can just walk out immediately after paying without scanning a thing. Hmm. So, you know, potentially that sounds like this, a good life. The new Amazon cart works better than RFID because RFID could have scanning errors. You know, it's all about bringing the errors down. But it, it points out that this technology is not new. The idea behind it is certainly not new. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Less, Frederick Hubner, and James P. Callison. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been busy illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us today, Len? Well, you know, it is World Emoji Day, and uh, it has been quite a week, uh, as you mentioned, uh, things going on uh, in the uh, Twitterverse and everything else. And here's an emoji that possibly could be added to that 117 <laughs> new emojis for uh, in a couple months. Maybe you'll make oh it 118. 
Yeah, this is um uh yeah, it's uh it's how it this is called artist rendering of the Twitter hack of 71520. It's uh it's a little bit uh, uh if I'm going to be descriptive uh a little violent. <laughs> Maybe possibly an inside it's job. Probably how a lot of Twitter employees felt on Wednesday to be honest. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. So uh yeah, I don't uh I, you know, I don't really necessarily see this as an emoji, but uh but maybe <laughs> take it under take it under advisement uh in it, the future. It could become an emoji for like I had a very bad day. <laughs> I had a like And this is where you send Wednesday somebody attack. and they go, I got it. I got <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, if you want to see this right now, it's uh, at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. You can actually download it. It's uh, it's available right now. Or if you like to go the old-fashioned way, you can uh, just buy it at my store at lenperaltastore.com. Very cool. Thank you, Len. Also, thanks to Rob Dunwood. So glad to have you back on the show, Rob. I know it's hot and humid where you are, but what else is going on in your world? Not a whole lot going on other than moving uh, college graduates into their new home. But, uh, you know, you guys can check me out over at the uh, SMR podcast. And I am at Rob Dunwood pretty much everywhere. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Rob Dunwood. Hey, if you're going to be in an enclosed space with a bunch of other people who might be infected with COVID-19, uh, you might want to wear a mask or even bring some for the other folks. And, and we have them available if you'd like one with a DTNS logo on it. You can find it at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. I'm wearing one right now. You are, and you look very dapper, and you also look like you're smiling, which is important. Everybody should smile at each other more. Hey, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And if you'd like to join us live, guess what? We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hope you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>